or good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when this finds you. Hope you're having a great day. If you've already got into your day, hope you have a great day if you hadn't started yet. Yeah. Today is June 19th. Uh, many of us down here in Texas you know, recognize Juneteenth for what it is. And I was originally going to do a video on nothing but Juneteenth for today. But I decided against that. Um, it's something growing up that was always celebrated in our house with my stepfather. He believed in Juneteenth. He didn't believe in Fourth of July. And his entire life up until he got sick, I only remember him not celebrating Juneteenth one year. And uh, he always requested that day off from work. And this particular year, he just got caught up in a rotation, so he wasn't able to take it off that year. But for the most part, he celebrated Juneteenth his entire life. And, it, you know, it's a celebration, you know, it's normally recognized on June 19th down here in the South, especially Texas. But it, it was actually a celebration from June 13th through June 19th when that word came down here through the shores of Galveston that the slaves had been freed with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation which had actually been signed two years prior. It's amazing that it took two years to get the message down here. You know, I know uh, we didn't have the technology back then where, you know, you could go super fast on trains or cars or planes like that, but still, you know, two years to get the message down and came to the shores of Galveston down there, Galveston Island. And, you know, every year my, Step dad would barbecue, you would buy watermelon and big red soda. Yuck. <laughs> I don't like any type of cream soda. That's just me though. But you know, that's just, you know, kind of just a brief little history on, you know, my life with as we celebrated Juneteenth growing up. And you know, I I don't barbecue and all that stuff for Juneteenth. You know, I do recognize it for what it is. You know, I've studied it. But, you know, it is what it is. But uh, I decided against speaking on Juneteenth because I, I just want to just talk about some other things that are going on right now. And, you know, if we're going to make things better, we're going to have to learn how to unite and stop all of this separation. Uh, right now, there's something called Project Icebreaker. And if, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the Bank of International Settlements. It's like the central bank of all the central banks. And Project Icebreaker is basically central bank and digital currency. And they're going to create something called a unicorn or umu or something like that uh, as they lead us into a one world currency. And they stated, you know, under this one world currency, you know, if you, your country, your company or your country is not obedient, they will cut off access to your central currency, your digital currency. And the guy literally said the reason they want to do that is because they can't tell and they can't track who's spending a hundred dollars here or a hundred dollars there. And they want to be able to track everything you do with money. That sounds exactly like slavery. It ain't no sound like it. It is slavery. And the way they're going to track you is not with human beings. They're going to track you with AI. So you're going to have robots giving you permission as to what you can and cannot do. I mean, you don't think it's actually uh, actual people sitting behind these fact checks on social media, do you? That, that's been AI all along. But, you know, I'm, I'm still not here to talk about that. I'm still just want to, 
you know, just want to let you know some things that are going on because most people are oblivious to everything that's going on. And you got pastors out here leading us into a one world religion. And they're so smooth with their words that most people sitting in the pews and the churches on Sundays don't even recognize what they're doing. And almost every one of the pastors that's doing this graduated from seminary. Y'all heard me talk about seminary quite a bit. And uh, I have no respect for it. You know, I'm just telling you ideas. And, you know, that's just my thoughts. I don't, I'm not talking about nobody else. It's just me. You know, I once had respect for it, but now that I've, started studying and research. I ain't got no respect for it. Let's see. Democratic voters will go to the polls and they'll vote because they believe Republicans are the problem because Democrats have, Democratic politicians have told them Republicans are the problem. Republican voters will go to the polls and vote because they believe Democrats are the problem because Republican voters have told them Democrats are the problem. Well, my thoughts are when Democrats are in office and they pass and write bills, we lose a little more freedom with each bill passed. And my thought also is when Republicans are in office and pass and write bills, <laughs> we lose a little more freedom with, with each bill passed. See, you know, why do you think both sides now say we are a democracy instead of a constitutional republic? You know, I've even heard some so-called independents, libertarians, and, you know, those groups state that we're even a democracy. Do you even understand what a democracy is? A democracy is the highest form of slavery. Every dem democracy historically has ended in despotism. Do you research? Despotism is slavery. And see, politicians have done so many things in the name of the so-called better good. You know, we've actually ended up as a socialist country. Well, in reality, we've always been a socialist country. <laughs> you know, we've never had true capitalism in this country, ever. You know, as much as people complain about capitalism and its evils, you know, um, in reality, they're complaining about socialism, communism, and feudalism. Now, true capitalism offers each individual equal opportunity to compete although it doesn't offer or promise equal outcomes. You know, what we have in America is a uh, crony capitalism masquerading as true capitalism. Crony capitalism is nothing more than socialism masquerading as capitalism. You know, as much as I've listened to opponents of capitalism, they, they're really not criticizing real capitalism. They're criticizing socialism. And at the same time, they're criticizing, criticizing capitalism, but uh, only capitalism in reality. Uh, they don't realize they're attacking socialism while at the same time advocating for socialism. You know, I saw somebody uh, said the other day, uh, Cornel West has thrown his head in uh, for the presidential, for the office of the president for the 2024 election. And, you know, they were talking about how much of a great socialist he is. I mean, Martin Luther King was a socialist. W.E.B. Du Bois was a socialist. And I don't know why these black leaders think socialism is the answer. But but I, I understand why they think capitalism is responsible for the ills because a lot of people have told them capitalism is what dominated the slave trade uh, of black people. Socialism and slavery are mirrors of each other. Socialism has a few at the top that control everything and everybody else is a serf. Capitalism doesn't do that. Even though the incomes have exploded like they have, that's what happens in socialism. That's why we keep hearing the rich get richer and the poor get poor. That didn't start when the word capitalism came around. That's been around since socialist and feudalist times. So, you know, the critical... In reality, they're criticizing, criticizing socialism. But at the same time, while they criticize socialism, thinking they're criticizing capitalism, they're pushing socialist agendas. 
I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And I remember, you know, having a conversation with a guy some years back. Uh, Donald, he's passed on now. He was older than I was. And he and I were talking about different economic systems. And, uh, you know, found out later, you know, through communication with him that one of his cousins, uh, older guy as well, was actually one of my Little League football coaches. And this Little League football coach actually gave me my, well, I, I would say my first job it was my first job at, that I got it when I, once I turned 16. But in reality, I had got a job uh, one summer working on a farm up in East Texas. I don't even remember what my hourly rate was when I worked on the farm. I know when I started working for Eckert Drugs, when my coach gave me that job, I was making three fifty an hour. And I was age 14 then when I worked on the farm. So I can't even imagine what my hourly rate was back then. I mean, I didn't know any better <laughs> for what I was being paid at the time. But anyway, you know, I need to hear another app. But Don and I were talking, and he told me that Jesus advocated for communism. And I said, I think you have communism mixed up with communal living. You see, they aren't the same thing. See, in a communal economic system, the people work together. They barter. They share the responsibility of maintaining the aesthetics of the community. Uh, they garden. They exchange produce. They form. They exchange animals for meat consumption. They look out for each other. They are... Uh, you know, make sure no outsiders come in and destroy things. They watch each other's homes. They watch each other's children to make sure nobody's doing anything ill toward another's children. You know, that's why they used to say, you know, uh, the neighbor would whoop you first. And then when you go home, they call your parents, you get another whooping because they wanted what they felt like was the best outcome for that child's life. So they wouldn't get in trouble. And, you know, so they could stack cards in their favor as they grew up. And so, you know, these people, they control the economics of this shared community. And I'm not saying they operate in a socialist type system. It's just everybody earns their own wealth, but everybody contributes to the upkeep and maintenance of the community themselves. And so it all works out together. And in a communist economic system, you know, the people own nothing. So they have nothing to share with one another. What did the WEF founder, Klaus Schwab, say? And you, you might want to get that book, The Great Reset, because it's upon us. In that book, he said, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That's why you got this metaverse and all this other virtual reality stuff coming out, because they want you to put these glasses on so you think you're living in reality. And that's why they're pushing you into using more public transportation with climate change and all of that stuff. They're saying you are destroying the air, although they own all these homes, they own all these jets, they own all these cars, and they're telling you with your one car that you're destroying the climate. They're saying cow farts are destroying the climate. <laughs> these folks are they're, they're wicked. But in a communist economic system, the people own nothing, so they have nothing to share with one another. You know, they pay for HOA presidents. And uh, HOA HOA presidents, uh, you know, like to tell them how to maintain and take care of their home, you know, because you're nothing. HOA presidents are nothing but a little narcissist anyway. You know, uh, that, that's, that's just my take on them. You know, I believe homeowners associations do have some good ideas, but I think the people in charge of them are terrible people. That's just me. And, uh, you know, in a communist system, you, you know, you have to pay for police protection. You know, you have to pay for your produce. You have to pay for your, your meat consumption, your animals. You know, they don't really look out for the children in the community. And if what does that sound like? That sounds like what we're living right now, almost. Because you do have some semblance of ownership with your vehicles in your home. But they're trying to do everything they can to take, even take that away from you. How many people lost their homes over the last three years with this whole situation that we were dealing with? How many people lost jobs during this whole period? And so that was a, a test run, people. 
that wasn't no accident. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and they tell us the situation happened in the 2019, early 2020. Well, I was in the hospital in 2018. They checked me for it four times. The same friend sent me a video uh, not too long ago. And a gentleman that was on the video was saying he went back and did research. And it was actually created in 1966. And I tell you, I'm, I'm just talking about stuff, you know, and I want to, <laughs> I'm just, like I said, I'm just talking, you know, uh, just about things that are going on. So you need to know. But if you go back and study history and you look at the most successful communities, the communal system is actually how they live. Even when, you know, they had jobs, they owned businesses and everything, you know, you know, the last few years, you know, a lot of people, you know, are having an awareness of Black Wall Street. But I knew about Black Wall Street years ago. And. The Black Wall Street in Tulsa was not the original Black Wall Street. The original Black Wall Street was in Durham, North Carolina. It was called Negro Wall Street. There was a successful black community in Richmond, Virginia called the Deuce. And uh, you had Black Bottom up in Detroit, I believe. And there, there are a lot more successful black communities. I can't speak of the white communities. I'm just telling you about the black community. But that's how those communities thrived and survived. See, they, one of the things you, I don't know if many of you know, in Tulsa, the money exchanged hands 36 times before it ever left the community. So everybody's enjoying the fruits of economic power. See, the only difference between socialism and communism is under socialism, the individual still owns the business on paper, but government reg regulations actually stifle the, stifle the business. In communism, the government owns all the business. Let me ask you a question. Now, where you live, I don't care where you are in the country, um, who is the biggest employer? Is it a private company or is it a government office? And say right now, you know, CBDCs are the hot topic in government. Bankers, uh, the wealthy, the elites, and a lot of government officials are buying silver and gold while they steer us into a digital money transition uh, tracking platform. You know, have you heard from any of your politicians on the Republican or Democrat side who are fighting against that system? You know, Ron DeSantis, the governor down in Florida, brought it up and he said Florida won't be using it. And then he announced his run for the presidency. So how much traction do you think that's going to get in Florida now that his attention is focused on the White House? You know, as far as I know, Ted Cruz is the only other politician that have brought it up that's against it. You know, Ted Cruz is down here in Texas. You know, but other than that, as far as I know, no other politician has brought up the topic. Not even Donald Trump. You know, I did a video on gun control, you know, here recently. And since that time, Democrats have ramped up their efforts. You know, they've come up with an idea to create a 28th Amendment in order to get rid of the Second Amendment. You know, Gavin Newsom is talking about it. And, uh, you know, speaking of Gavin Newsom, you know, he's trying to propose a exit tax. <laughs> so when you move out of California, every year you get a tax bill from California for leaving the state. So he's going to punish you for leaving the state. I mean, it baffles me how people keep voting for people like Newsom, but black folks down here in Texas complaining about Greg Abbott, and Greg Abbott is nothing like Gavin Newsom. Now, I have my issues with Greg Abbott, but if we're going to choose between Greg Abbott and Gavin Newsom, I'm going with Greg Abbott every time. See, the problem is we don't understand the difference between freedom and slavery. But, you know, Newsom talking about the 28th Amendment. This dude is protected by a 24-hour security detail. But he's saying you don't need to have weapons yourself. You know, it's amazing that these guys are sitting here and say, you know, an 18-year-old, 
don't need a weapon. A 30-year-old don't need a weapon. A 40-year-old don't need a weapon. A 70-year-old don't need a weapon. 18-year-old shouldn't be allowed to buy a weapon. But he's one of the same people that have no problem getting an 18-year-old to sign government documents to go and fight a war in another country. It's okay for an 18-year-old to have a weapon then. Y'all vote for a whole bunch of hypocrites. I don't, I don't understand y'all. You know, but, you know, talking about that 28th Amendment, you know, before June 5th, you know, it was a, you know, these women were talking about marching on the state capitol in Colorado. They were going to try to get the governor to, you know, put up, you know, resistance to the Second Amendment and get behind the 28th Amendment. And, uh, supposed to be 25,000 white women that were going to march on the state capitol. And see, I said white women because they themselves made it clear that white women are always the ones in America who get things done because they are the most revered group in the country. They literally said this themselves They were in an interview with Joy Reid. But guess what? Less than 500 women showed up for this march. Uh, but they said they're not done because... They said they plan on marching, I believe, on 23 more state capitals around the country. Well, you know, they go right ahead and said, you know, one event is not going to deter them. You know, the governor of Colorado said he isn't going after the Constitution. So if a strong left leftist want to attack the Constitution, they're going to have a hard time in these pro-Second Amendment states trying to get something like that to fly. You know, white women are around here being the voice talking against white supremacy and about white supremacy. But these white women just use the racial platform of whiteness to try to get something done that's unconstitutional. See, that's how the black women, our black women got tri tricked into the feminist movement by white women. These white women say they want to allow the government to buy back all the guns. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. You know, it's kind of like a sort of the black flight attendant, that dude, you know, he was talking about that guy, you know, on the plane, talking about he going to blow everybody up and all that. And uh, he said, hold up, wait a minute. He said, he got that duct tape, you know, <laughs> he said, hold up, wait a minute. But how is the government going to buy back something that it never paid for in the first place? They said they want to get rid of all the guns. But in that same interview, they said white men are the ones with most of the guns. Now, I might be a little slow, and, and my sister probably agree with me. <laughs> but there isn't a chance in hell that white men are giving up their gun. And believe it or not, these white women know that their husbands won't give up their guns. But what they would do is use other women, like they're doing with the Asian American Indian woman, who was in the interview as well, they'll use Asian Indian woman just like they did with black women in the feminist movement. They'll play on the emotional strings of other women of different races and ethnicities and convince them to get their husbands to give up their guns. And then whites will be the only ones with guns. Y'all better wake up. Y'all better wake up. See, that's how they sold black women on the feminist movement. They convinced black women that they didn't need a man in their home. They were just as good as men. They were just as equal as men. They should receive equal pay as men. Now, I believe if you're doing the same work, you should receive equal pay. But, you know, me and my wife are just alike. <laughs> it's the differences that are important. <laughs> if that makes sense to you. So... They convinced black women that they didn't need a man in their home. They convinced black women that they were just as equal as men and they should actually go out into the workforce and abandon their children into daycare. And see, when did the feminist movement take place? In the 1960s. When did the daycare industry start to really expand? Started in 1972, just a couple of years after the end of the feminist movement. So y'all don't pay attention to this stuff. So black women sent their children to daycares all over the country and almost all your daycares were at the time manned by 
who? White women. <laughs> so you created a whole new entire industry for white women to earn an income while you had to take money out of your pocket now, even though you were going out there to fight for equal pay with your man. You empowered white women and you lost power yourself by listening to white women. And so these, these black women sent their children to daycares all over the country and then they put their men out of the homes on the advice of white women. Say white women, you know, came out, you know, a few years back and said that black women were the driving force for the feminist movement. And at the same time, these white women said that and did that, they said they, they actually stayed, they remained in their homes. They remained stay at home moms. They never left their men. They never asked their men to get out of the house. And now white women are the ones leading the push for stripping gun rights, using an Asian Indian woman as the face for this movement. Now, I have to ask, who is the most manipulative group of people in this country? And at the same at the same token, who is the most honored group of people in this country? Hey, don't get mad at me for telling you the truth. You know, because that's what it is. You know, we don't want to hear this stuff, but it's the truth. Politicians, you know, are always saying that Social Security is running on exhaust fumes when, when you know, they need to increase the debt. Well, what you need to know is if you're not a white female and you die while you still have money in your Social Security account, your resources are put into a fund to take care of the person who has the longest lifespan in this country, the white female. That's why they sit there and, you know, a, a black woman can lose her husband. And uh, if he was getting full Social Security benefits, you know, she'll only get a portion of his benefits because the rest of his benefits are going into a fund for white women. And it's the same way if a, if a black woman dies before her husband and she was getting Social Security, he'll only get a portion of her Social Security benefit because the rest of it, the great majority of it goes into a fund to take care of white women. Now, isn't it amazing that you worked your whole life, your spouse worked their whole life, and... Both of y'all have put money into the Social Security account. But when one die, you don't get to keep full access to your spouse's Social Security benefits. You get basically one fourth to one third of your spouse's Social Security benefit upon death. And the other two thirds goes in or three fourths goes into a fund to take care of white women. I mean, come on people, come on. Y'all y'all got to get from under the, in front of these televisions. Y'all got to get off y'all phones. Y'all got to start studying this stuff. See, and, and as I always say, y'all know my phrase is, don't take my word for anything, go study it for yourself. You know, on a social security issue, you know, I, I talked to a white woman who's close to my wife and I. And a few years back, I gave a political speech in front of an organization. It was a nonpartisan organization. And I talked about that money going into a fund to take care of white women. And she replied back to me. She said, yeah, Myron. She said, you know, there are a few, a few things that, you know, take place before it happens. She said, but you're absolutely correct. It goes into a fund to take care of us. That's amazing. So if this particular white woman knows this, I'm certain a lot more of them know it as well. See, I remember when Mr. 9-11 was in office. You know, he proposed, uh, proposed the idea of privatizing Social Security. He said he thought the people themselves could do a better job of managing the money uh, than the government had been doing all these years. 
and both your Congress and your Senate oppose the idea. But it's amazing that Social Security is always the hot topic along with veterans benefits doing debt ceiling talk. They're always talking about punishing the people because of their mismanagement. You see, why do your Congress and, and, and your senators never talk about cutting their pay? You know, it's all it, 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 it's always amazed me how they never bring up their pay as something that will be impacted in debt ceiling talks. And if you go back and understand the whole political spectrum, your politicians were never supposed to be paid as careers. Because they knew if they started treating their position in office as a career, they would do as much as they could to make sure they maintain that income. And what do you see? You got these lifers in there. You got people been in office longer than folks been living. Grown folks I'm talking about. You know, Joe Biden's been in, 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 in uh, politics since 19, what, 71, 72? That's sickening. And he'd been a racist from day one. And y'all Negroes went out and voted for her. Because y'all talk about Trump was racist. I just don't understand it. But they were never supposed to be lifers like they are. They weren't supposed to be paid like they are. They were supposed to get a little stipend. They weren't supposed to get yearly and monthly income. They were supposed to get stipends like some of these uh, um, coaches do in high schools and things like that. On like, you know, special teachers that teach special ed, and they get, they get a little bit extra pay, but they don't get enough in the stipend to quit the actual teaching part of the job, if that makes sense. And see, that's how your Congress and Senators were supposed to be compensated as well. But... You know, but they never bring up their pay as something that's going to be ever impacted by debt ceiling talks. You know, and the sad thing about it is not party specific. Neither your Democrats or Republicans ever bring up their pay being impacted. You see, Republicans act like they're against a debt situation when Democrats are in charge, but they know the whole time they're going to support it. They know it's going to pass, but they put on that dog and pony show for us. You know, I'm just sick and tired of the dog and pony show. Hey, if you still have faith in these jackasses on both sides, I have no problem with that. But I don't have any faith in any of them on either side. You know, I mentioned Greg Abbott earlier. And, and Abbott is actually trying to eliminate property tax in the state of Texas. I don't know all the parameters surrounding it. But I do know he said we have this uh, $2.3 trillion economy in Texas and we got $17.6 billion sitting there that's been collected from uh, property tax and all that. And he said we need to do a better job and get this money back to the people so they can take care of their lifestyle with all of this stuff, this inflation and all this other stuff that's going on. But like I said, I don't know. The parameters around it and right now he's battling at odds with people in his party see i'm telling you he's not getting opposition from democrats right now he's getting opposition from republicans what did i just call them jack asses and so republican democrat your representatives don't care about you they find ways to make sure to continue to increase taxes on you, but they can never find a way to decrease taxes. You know, it's just like a few years ago when they eliminated the emission part of car inspections here in Texas. This actually decreased the cost of car inspections by $15. Next thing you know, our car registration costs increased by $20 or more. Now they're talking about eliminating the inspection process altogether which is a, would be another cut of $25 because car inspection with the inspection with the emissions part was $40. So they're talking about eliminating inspections altogether. The, uh, the senator behind this push for eliminating the inspection sticker said, you know, if it passes, you know, the average citizen will see a savings of about $7. 
So we first eliminated a $15 charge and got a $20 more increase on registration. Now they want to eliminate the other $25 and said we will save $7. See, what kind of math do your politicians do? See, their math always makes things worse for us. Their math always enslaves us further. Their math always puts us into more bondage to government. They put us into more bondage to the government so they can make sure government remains big, strong, and powerful. And then they tell us of the necessity of big government. Are you tired of it yet? See, I believe Ann Rand, uh, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D, you know, she said something when she was living. And she said, when the government uh, makes laws to protect themselves from the people, instead of making laws to protect the people from themselves, uh, how did she say it? Uh, are you in slavery? Something. I don't remember exactly. I just, I'm just trying to take it off the top of my head. But y'all get the idea. You know, these same people who act like they care about us have told us to fear climate change viruses. They've told us to fear blacks. They've told us to fear white. They've told us to fear gun advocates. They've told us to fear each other. They've told us to fear Democrats. They've told us to fear Republicans. They've told us to fear independent. They've told us to fear libertarians. They've told us to fear, uh, fear the elderly. they told us to fear our youth. They've told us to fear aliens. They've told us to fear UFOs. Uh, they've told us to fear the poor. They've told us to fear immigrants. They've told us to fear black men, especially if they big black men. They, they've told us to fear angry black women. And they, the system has made all of our black women angry, you know, according to the system. They, they, they've told us uh, to fear white men. They've told us to fear terrorists. They've told us to fear the sick. And, and whatever else they can come up with to separate us. Notice one group of people that I didn't mention. They've never told us to fear white women. <laughs> and who's doing all of your talk on diversity? Who's doing all your talk on racism? White women. You know, you got the book White Fragility. I mean, I have the book. Yeah. She's leading diversity conferences. A white woman. <laughs> a white woman ain't diverse. She ain't a woman of color, like y'all like to say now. Uh, you, get, you have Jane Elliott, you know, talking about racism all these years. And, uh, so why are white women leading the charge on diversity? You know why? Because most of your CEOs are white men. So they're going to choose and pay people that look like them so they can keep the money circulating within their race. And then it gives the illusion that white women are a minority and they're fighting for women's rights. No, they're fighting for white women's rights. See, there was a black lady, uh, Robin D'Angelo, uh, the author of White Fragility. She spoke at a diversity conference. Well, at the same diversity conference, a black woman spoke at that conference. They are represented by the same talent agency. The lady in charge of booking them is a black lady. Robin DeAngelis received 70% more than the black woman at the same diversity conference. But see, I'm not even here to talk about that. But, you know, but you, you look at what the government does. Who is the one that accuses everybody else for doing the very thing they are doing? See, the people who do the worst things are always the ones accusing another person of doing it. You know, how many cheaters have accused their partner of cheating? How many lies have accused others of lying? You know, who is guilty of creating a mass hysteria about all of those subject areas that I've mentioned? You know, how often do they lie to us? So why do we keep voting for them? You, you can only stop the behavior when you stop voting for it each election cycle. Until then, the cycle is going to continue to repeat itself. See, stop playing in a game that you're guaranteed to lose. You know, it's kind of like you going to play basketball against Michael Jordan. You ain't going to win. <laughs> and that's what you're doing when you keep voting for, especially these incumbents. 
you keep going to vote for the same people over and over again. And nothing improves. So we're playing in a game that we're going to lose each and every election. See, I, as black people, our ancestors never fought for the right to participate in a system such as this. See, before 1964, we complained about our treatment as blacks. Now, however, while we complained, we still built things. We built businesses. We built schools. And, you know, we fought to keep our families together. After 1964, all we're doing is complaining. We haven't built anything of significant value. We don't strive to be business owners. We don't strive to have our own schools. I mean, we don't even go to our HBCUs anymore. I think uh, of all college age black folks, 14% of blacks in this country choose to go to HBCUs. 14% out of 100% of college graduates, black graduates, I mean, um, black college age students that choose only 14% of college age students attend HBCUs. But y'all want to run around here and talk about black power. I'm for the fight. I'm, I'm fighting for my people. But you don't even want to be around your people. You don't even want to go to school with your people. At least you'll get some semblance of your history in these schools. So, we don't try to have our own schools no more. We don't even care about our own schools. You know, we don't fight for our marriages and families anymore. The only thing we have been striving for since the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act was signed is more politics, politicians, and government intervention into our lives. We think if we get a political seat, you know, we've arrived. We're not realizing every time we get a political seat, the train and already left. You know, we have allowed the people who bully others to turn others into bullies themselves. The government is bullying us. You know, look at how those who refused to take the government solution the last two years were treated by those who did. Look at how the government made the obedient people, the allies of the government, and made everybody else into enemies of the state and the people. The government turned the people against each other. And the people fell for it. Well, let me clear that the people who took the government solution fell for it. See, the others recognized the game up front. The people who control you are turning those who believe in a higher being against everything that higher being stands for. See, those who are rulers of darkness as stated in Ephesians. Or, or those... Uh, People that are turning you against everything that's moral, godly. And see, don't come at me with Romans 13 either. The original text in Romans 13 says to obey higher authorities or higher beings. Modern Bibles say to obey government authorities. See, we have a lot of poorly translated Bible verses. And what you need to know is the same people who control the printing presses are the exact same ones who control your government behind the scenes. That's why your Bible's all screwed up. And see, that's whether it Republicans in office or Democrats in office, the same people controlling both sides. So it, it, ain't, it ain't really one side, it's one side with two names. But it's one side. That's why they always say a, a bird needs two feathers or two wings to fly. A right wing and a left wing. The United States government needs both wings to fly. Because they keep these both wings going to give the give you the illusion that we actually have a choice. When all we have is one system here. Socialists. You got socialist Republicans and you got socialist Democrats. Democrats more communists than socialists. You know, but I call Democrats socialist, socialist and I call Republicans socialist light. So, because the Republicans getting just where Democrats are. You know, the only thing they've stood on for years is uh, abortion rights and Second Amendment. Everything else is, is up for grabs. You know, it's on the table. So, you know, we'll have the conservative-minded thinking people standing with 
you know, politicians who claim to be God-fearing Christian, uh, you know, in order to secure the religious vote, all the while they're some of the most violent, corrupt people on the planet. You know, Democrats don't even try to hide or masquerade their disdain for anything godly. They let you know that everything they do is in total opposition to, to biblical values. And, and, you know, black people still vote for them in mass. Then black folks go to church on Sunday, ask for God to put his hand and his protection around them for all the wickedness in the world that they voted for. <laughs> See, these politicians, Democrats and Republicans, Believe in everything that is in direct opposition of goodness, love, selflessness, empathy. They believe in evil. I mean, look at how many celebrities and pro athletes have done these unethical things to their children. They can dress their boys in dresses, allow gender reassignment surgery, and CPS allows this. If CPS government control. But for a parent who wants to address his daughter as a girl because she was a born a, a girl, he was threatened with prison. In the last three years, parents who refused to allow their children to drink the government juice were threatened with the loss of their children. The state threatened to take their children away because they refused. See, these people believe in chaos. They believe in disorder. See, it's like when we go back to the account in Genesis when the earth as we know it was created. Genesis or uh, Bershit. Uh, Bershit is the Hebrew name as it was before. They changed it. So Genesis' original name is Bershit. It, it actually states that there was darkness on the earth. The earth, it says the earth was void. It said the earth was formless. See, to me, that means that there was a place that existed before the, the original creation account because when Lucifer and the angels were kicked out, they had to go somewhere. You see, how can I say this? Well, I was reading the book of Enoch and uh, I need to, I want to pull a verse out of Enoch for you. Give me a second. Enoch chapter 69 verse 4 reads, The name of the first is Yacon. This is an angel. Yacon is an angel. This is the one who led astray all the children of the holy angels. And he brought them down onto the dry ground. And led them astray through the daughters of men. The name of the serpent that led Eve astray in the garden is named Gadriel. See, that's the end of it. Um, I've said for years when we change dimensions, the form of our bodies must change as well. See, although we start to form into a body at inception, we can't survive outside of the womb until months later. Because we have to wait for things to form. See, when we're born, we become a different body. When we die, we become a different body. See, as we change dimensions, our bodies have to change as well. And that's why Yah said before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. That means we had to be with him before we came into this physical place. And, and my understanding and study has led me to believe after what happened with Lucifer and the angels, you know, because we were all with him at one time, I believe he said, okay, let me get him a chance to go do what they want to do. Let, let them go sin. Let them go do all these things that's immoral. And then they can come back to me, the ones that want to, and the ones that don't, you know, I got a place for them too. But that's just me. So he has some parameters in there, but he said, hey, I'm not forcing you to do it. You can choose to do it or you can choose not to. But I'm going to let you go live on this earthly plane for a little while so you can make a choice if you want to be with me again so I don't have this situation where I got this rebellion going on up here. Say, I'm tired of worshiping God. <laughs> oh, you know, hey, homies, 130 of y'all. You know, and like Bernie Mac say, who you with? Lucifer say, who you with? <laughs> and a lot of people believe that now they... A lot of them angels believe that, so they uh, damn to hell for the rest of their existence. And so that's just my thought that God has given us an opportunity to say, hey, you know, do you want to be with me or not? I'm giving you the choice to, to make the decision. I'm not going to force you to worship me. You can or you can't. It's up to you. Totally up to you. So, you know, that that's just my thoughts of before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you. So... In saying all that, 
somebody had to already be here on earth. I mean, if we read our Bibles correctly, when Cain was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it says he went to another land and got married. Well, where did the other people come from for him to take a wife? That means somebody had to be somebody else had to be here. And see, I, I actually emailed uh, one of the top evangelicals. You know, everybody know, you know, he's died now. You know, BG. I emailed his organization and asked this question because I was in some study. This this is probably about 20 years ago. And I said, hey, can you, what, you know, where did Cain, where did these people come from? Where did Cain get a wife from? Uh, you know, and the response I got was, well, you know, God took care of that stuff. So, you know, he must have married one of his sisters. No, 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 no that, uh, that didn't sit right with me. And so that's why I just keep studying. But how, how did I get off on all that stuff? Oh, <laughs> uh, let me get back to what stuff I was talking about. <laughs> you know, your politicians believe in destroying family units. They believe in destroying a spiritual presence in everybody's life. Because, see, when you can destroy a, a spiritual presence in people like then government becomes your God. And that's what we've seen with a lot of people. Government has become their God. See, they believe in destroying masculinity. I mean, we have an entire month dedicated to anti-masculinity. Uh, think about this. They designated the month of June to celebrate anti-masculinity. See, why would they declare the, uh, June the month of this when we celebrate Father's Day? Why didn't they do it in the month of May? Because, see, when, with Mother's Day. Because the whole idea is to destroy masculinity and not femininity. See, Isaiah 3 and 12 uh, describes it perfectly, in my opinion, you know, where it talks about, uh, I, it's a certain translation I, I like. I want to read it to you. Let me, give me a second. Because it's one translation. I mean, it's it's like uh, 57 different versions I read, but I like this one the best. Oh, how I ache for my people. They are oppressed by children, ruled by women, naive and inexper inexperienced. Oh, my people, your leaders are misleading you, guiding you down a path to disaster. And, you know, and I, as I stated before, you know, we need to read what surrounds a verse, not just one verse. Because right before in verse 11, it says, woe to the wicked man into evil. You know, for well, why the yielding of his hand shall be made to him. Woe to the wicked person unto evil, for the reward of his hand or the fruit of his labor shall be given to him. And see, the objective is to give women rulership and ownership over men. See, the agenda is to make men more feminine in their thinking. You know, think about Jezebel and her husband. And uh, Jezebel was the dominating woman. But you see what happened to Jezebel. She thought she could turn her charm on even the eunuchs that, that went together. You know, she's going to put on her makeup and dress herself up and read your Bible. It's right in there telling you what she did. So, you know, they want women to rule over men. Why do they want women to rule over men? Why do they want men to be more feminine in their thinking? See, women are emotional thinkers, and when emotions are touched, they will do practically anything, even if it's against their own best interest. So the idea is to get more men to become emotional instead of rational and analytical thinkers. The feminist movement has already accomplished this in black America, and that's why our young men kill each other the way they do. See, being raised by mothers only has caused them to be emotional thinkers. Why is it that we see more young black men staying at home with their mama, but we hardly see any black women, females living at home with that same mother? See, the black mother has been instructed by white feminists to go at it alone. So she teaches her daughters that same thought process. She teaches her daughter to not depend on no man. Think about this. There was no sin when Adam was alone. Sin entered the world when Eve arrived on the scene. But I still blame Adam for it because Adam shouldn't have been letting no other dude talk to his woman when he was standing there. 
And see, the feminist movement started a great deal of what we're dealing with right now. The church embraced it, and the church started to deliver messages with a feminist slant so they could be just like the government. The government gave us the feminist movement to get more taxpayers into the system. That's why they wanted the women out of the house, so they could bring more taxpayers into the system. Go find that Aaron Russo, even Aaron Russo and Alex Jones video and let Aaron Russo uh, explain it to you. So the government gave us the feminist movement to get more taxpayers into the system. And then the church caters their messages to get more women to give them money and call tax tithes, but it's actually a church tax is all it is. It's a tax, a church, a tithe ain't nothing but a church tax. And see, now the government has put feminism and debauchery on display for all of us to recognize and accept whether we want to or not. They were just waiting on it to go mainstream in the churches. See, they believe in destroying reproductive rights. That's why they gave you Roe versus Wade. Yet, many people in society think they're interested in their well-being. You see, everything that white America does to try and destroy black progress come back and bite them in the rear end. They've been trying to reduce black birth rates for years, and now they are the... The only group of people with the lowest birth rate. Now, you know, they, they got the black woman to get rid of her white, I mean, her husband, her black man, her, the children of her, the father of her children. They got her to get rid of him. Now white men are leaving the home faster than black men. White men are in court right now more than black men for not paying child support. When the crack epidemic was created, nothing was handed out to blacks but prison sentences. Now that opioids are dominating white America, they aren't handing out prison sentences. First responders are handing out Narcan to save them. They get off with rehab instead of prison. Hey, y'all voted for Biden. You know, one guy said this. Let me read some. I was reading somewhere the other day. He said, if you still trust government, unelected globalist, big former idolized celebs, you may not be bright enough to know when you're being lied to, gaslighted and mocked. That lack of awareness is dangerous to yourself and others. The reason people thought they were sicker is because the government told them that and they forgot what it felt like to get the flu. People complying to go along to get along are in for a rude awakening. You see, both now, as I mentioned earlier, is an illusion of choice. It, it, it's like when you go to vote, it don't matter which side you're on. You know, it's like asking the question, which one do you prefer? You know, 40 grams of sugar in Pepsi or 40 grams of sugar in Coke. Either way, it's not healthy. You know, uh, other illusion of choice. You know, you want some Mo juice, you want some PF juice, or you want some J&J juice. You know, three choices are the only ones offered, but neither of them are good for you. And now they're talking about, they're working on one now, the, P ju the PF juice. They're talking about combining their juice with the flu juice into one concoction. You know, have you ever noticed that the option to not choose either soda is ever pre presented? Or the option to not drink juice wasn't presented? But yet, they give you the illusion of choice. Stop voting for people who subjugate you. That goes for both sides of the political fence. I know a lot of people got faith in, you know, Trump running again. And they ain't, I don't, Trump, DeSantis, Tim Scott, uh, Cornel West, Joe, ain't none of them gonna change this system. The system is operating the way it was designed to operate. Stop putting your faith. I don't, you know, Trump did a few things that I like, but stop putting your faith in Trump coming back to office. Trump need to go out to pasture too. They're too old. They need to go somewhere. Stop getting your hopes up behind this stuff, behind these folks, behind these immoral people. That goes for both sides. You don't get change at the ballot box. You get change at the economic box. Why do you think they're working so hard to take your economic power away? And, and I'm, I'm going to read this and I'm going I'm to close out.
I've been talking long enough. Another guy said this, people are so desperate for a savior, they stop demanding action and settle for sweet nothings whispered in their ears by politicians and unelected globalists. Think of all the nefarious agendas being pushed and the people responsible. Who has been held accountable? Create a political system for the masses to participate in, but keep all re real decision making and power in the hands of unelected globalists. Keep the masses distracted and dependent on mindless entertainment. And I'll talk to you later.